evening. My name is Michael Zimmerman. I'm a program assistant with the University of Maryland Extension. And our goal is to provide educational opportunities about the Marcellus Shale so that citizens of our area can make informed decisions. And tonight's lecture is being presented on the geology of the Marcellus Shale in Western Maryland by Mr. Jeff Halka. Mr. Halka has been with the uh, Maryland Geological Survey since 1975. Um, he was principal geologist for coastal and estuarine geology in 1998. He became the acting director of the Geological Survey in 2007 and the director in 2010. Um, so at this time, I would like to introduce to you Mr. Jeff Halka. At some point, if I'm speaking too low, just let me know, um, because I have a tendency to do that, and we'll get going. Um, just want to point out. I think already we need you to step Already too low. Yeah. Topic. All right. We'll work on it. Um, just want to say, um, my co-author and actually the person who put this together most prominently is Dave Brzezinski, who unfortunately can't be here tonight, so um, I'm standing in in, in, in his stead, and. Um, as Michael said, I'm primarily a coastal geologist, so this is a little, a little far afield for me, so you have to bear with me. Um, and before we kind of get into Marcellus, I just want to uh, cover a little bit about um, the Maryland Geological Survey. We're a state agency. We were created in 1896. This is my little plug for us, you know, um, by the state legislature long before there was a Department of Natural Resources, which we are now part of. Um, and if you can read up here um, that the original <clears throat> statement in the legislation was that we were supposed to conduct topographic, geologic, hydrographic, and geophysical surveys, prepare maps and reports, and such about the extent of the state's geology and mineral and water resources, and, uh, and to periodically assess paleontological resources. Um, it's kind of interesting, if you look at the history of the survey, we were originally on Hopkins campus until the late 70s, and um, the first uh, agricultural soils map came out of uh, the Maryland Geological Survey. The first road survey in the state was done out of the Maryland Geological Survey, which ultimately led to the State Highway Administration. Um, water resources were first evaluated in the survey and, and moved to DNR and ultimately to Maryland Department of Environment. Bureau of Mines was in the Maryland Geological Survey. So I sort of feel like, you know, we were really sort of the spawn of, uh, the spawn of a large government in Maryland, um, even though there's only 18 of us up there now. Um, www.mgs for Maryland Geological Survey.md.gov, so you can come and see what we do there. And just briefly, there's three sort of functional areas that we work in now um, coastal and estuarine geology, we primarily study uh, sediment transport in the bay, uh, shore erosion, uh, locating sand for beach replenishment, and uh, most recently, mapping um, bottom habitat for oyster restoration. We also work in what I kind of call classical geology. mineral resources, uh, including things like Marcellus Shale, um, coal resources, and so on. And by far, our largest function right now is hydrogeology. Um, most 60 to 70 percent of the population of Maryland gets their water out of the ground in one form or another, either as private wells or from uh, municipal supplies. And uh, basically, we are the guys who figure out how much water is down there. And you know, Maryland's been pretty blessed uh, with lots of water but we're starting to reach, particularly in the Baltimore-Washington corridor, we're starting to reach the, the limits of that resource, and we need to plan adequately in the future. So we're embarking on a major effort with MDE, Maryland Department of the Environment, and the U.S. Geological Survey to, uh, to <clears throat> map and model all the groundwater resources in the state, and that's going to be a multi-year effort. But you're not here to hear about all that tonight. Um, you want to know a little bit about Marcellus. 
Um, I'm a geologist. I'm going to talk about the Marcellus from the perspective of geology um, and how it came to be, a little bit about the gas resources. Um, as you all know, Marcellus is in part of the Appalachian Basin, uh, which is really the, the beginning of the uh, world's oil and gas industry. And um, it's interesting, in 1821 up uh, in, in western New York, near Lake Erie, uh, the first gas well was dug by hand to 21 feet um, and basically lit the equivalent of two candles. Um, by the mid-1850s, they were drilling some wells for gas. Um, and then uh, the Drake well was uh, drilled for petroleum in western, uh, western Pennsylvania. And sort of oil drilling supplanted the gas industry um, from then on for many years um, until around 1901 uh, when the, uh, the spindle top, which was just a big gusher, and nobody could believe how much oil came out of it in Texas, and the whole industry just kind of migrated to Texas. But then there's, renewed, there's always been some gas uh, drilling that's gone on in, in uh, the Appalachian Basin, including uh, Western Maryland, not a whole lot in Western Maryland, but certainly a significant amount in uh, Ohio and Pennsylvania and, and West Virginia. And in uh, 2004, uh, Range Resources came uh, and, and drilled a well. Marcellus, they went through it and said, yeah, there's some gas there. And then they started to um, fool around with a little bit of fracking, um, which is a, a technique that was being uh, pioneered and learned about in the Barnett um, shale down in Texas. And lo and behold, they discovered there was a lot of, uh, a lot of available gas. And, and here we are today. So, Marcellus is commonly referred to as a, a conventional, excuse me, as an unconventional gas resource. And what I wanted to briefly cover was what we consider a conventional gas resource. Basically, you need three things. You need an organic rich shale, like the Marcellus, and that's a source rock. You need, you need to heat it, you need to pressurize it so you can get some of that gas out, or oil, any kind of hydrocarbon. Usually it comes out of that rock because that rock is pretty tight. And, uh, and it then will migrate into a more porous rock uh, where, and, and in this diagram it's shown sort of migrating upward by those squiggly lines, and it'll keep on migrating up and just come out at the surface at some point. I think, you know, La Brea Tar Pits is a good example in California where oil just comes out to the surface. There's lots of evidence of gas coming out at the surface too. Um, but if there's a trap rock that will cap that, <coughs> that uh, migration and stop it in the porous rock, then, uh, that's your third component that you need. So you need the source, you need, uh, you need to cook it, you need to migrate it into a, a porous rock, which is usually a sandstone or a limestone, and then you need a trap rock to hold it in place. And then, and then simply the way conventional um, oil and gas was always uh, searched for was sort of exemplified in this diagram. We just stick a soda straw down into a place where we think because of the structure or the faults, um, that this oil or gas, these hydrocarbon resources would be uh, would be trapped. And in the early days, they just started sticking wells everywhere because they didn't really understand too much about how things were migrating. Now, of course, we've gotten much better at that. But this is a, a diagram of convention. So, what is the Marcellus Shale? Well, is it a gas source bed? Is it the reservoir? Or is it the trap or the seal? Well, the reality is, it's really all three. So we'll explore that a little bit. Primarily in, in Western Maryland, the target for gas resources over the years has been the, the Euriscony sandstone, uh, which is actually underneath the Marcellus. And the Euriscony sandstone, not being a shale, is more porous. It has a lot of uh, fossils here. There's uh, Pod fossils. Um, those, uh, some of them are dissolved, so there's a lot of pore space in the Ariscony sandstone. And, and overlying it is the Marcellus. And it's interesting that, you know, we usually think of the gas is migrating up, but deep enough in the ground with enough pressure, the mass, the, the, uh, the hydrocarbon will go from into a, a pore space if it's available. So 
the Marcellus sits on top of the Oriskany, and whenever the drillers went through the Marcellus, they'd say, hey, there's some gas there, but, you know, and, and if they stop, they'd actually get a little bit of gas out, but it wouldn't last too long. So it kept on going and going to the Oriskany. Just a picture of uh, Marcellus and outcrop. It's a tight um, shale, uh, very solid, uh, very high organic matter, and you can kind of see some of the, uh, there's some fracture planes on this, on this outcrop, and we'll return to that in a little bit. So there's a little movie here. Um, we'll run through it a couple times, and hopefully I'll stop it at the right spot. But you can see, basically, you've got a well on the surface. We're going to look at the conventional well first. Now we're trying to get down into the Oriskany. We're going to go through the Marcellus, which is the source bed. straight down. The stem is being driven from the surface. And then when we stop. And then when we uh, get into through the Marcellus and into the Oriskany where the uh, where the porosity is, we'll withdraw the gas. But all that all that driving is being done from the surface well. Shown on the on your right there is now what we're going to do in the unconventional uh, Marcellus well. So the well goes down for some, the well is drill, drilled down for some period, again driven by the surface. And then when they reach the Marcellus, there's some point above it called the kickoff point. They turn, it, turn the uh, drill head sideways. And actually, that involves removing the entire stem and putting a separate item down. I'll show that in a second. <coughs> and then they drill sideways through the Marcellus. When they get as far as they want to or can do, uh, then there's this fracking process that goes on by you know, driving the water down and, and basically opening up the pore spaces in the, uh, in the shell, which is otherwise, uh, while there's a lot of gas in there, it's all disconnected in these little pores that, are, that doesn't allow the gas to flow. <coughs> so we're fracking it and adding water and then, and then withdrawing gas that way. So the difference is, at the beginning, we're both going straight down with, with the, uh, both the conventional and the unconventional resource. With the unconventional uh, resource, then we have to do some fracking, stimulation. There's different terms. And the key to this uh, unconventional, uh, to, to tapping things like the Marcellus, is what's called the, uh, uh, the downhole mud motor. And basically, this is driven by hydraulic pressure at the surface, and, and it turns the whole whole stem no longer turns, just the motor head, and they can they can guide that somehow from the surface, um, similar to when they're laying uh, you know fiber optic cable or something. Uh, these days, they, they have those molds that just you know drive stuff uh, horizontally through the ground. So as you know, uh, you know the Marcellus covers a pretty extensive area from central New York uh, under Lake Erie um, to Pennsylvania, uh, Maryland, far western Maryland, a uh, little bit, tiny, tiny bit of Virginia, um, West Virginia and westward into Ohio. Um, and it, along with all the other, this is showing the extent of the Devonian shales, which is uh, an age, a, a geologic age, we'll cover that in a second. Um, and this survey was done um, in the mid 80s, I believe. Published in 2006 um, by a, um, an effort by the federal government to establish how much um, gas there might be in these in these uh, potential resources for the future. And the area outlined in red is called the uh, the Devonian Shale Sweet Spot (DSS). And that was at that point in time. That's what said. This is where this would be the best spot, probably, if there was with the most gas potential. See, it's a little bit to the west. So, how did the Marcellus come to be? I'm going to talk a little bit about geologic time in Maryland and then look at uh, the events that happened, the tectonic events that led to the deposition of, uh, of the sediments and the organic material that ultimately uh, became the, the gas, Marcellus shale and the gas resources. So, geologic time basically, um, looking on the <clears throat> About 540 million years ago is, is sort of the beginnings of life um, on Earth. A little before that, actually, but <coughs> fossils, most of the fossils around then. Um, and we're going to expand this then. Um, 
to look at that, the period from that point on. Um, we started the uh, Cambrian at the base, moving through all these geologic ages. And just on the far right, maybe a little bit smaller, down in the Cambrian, the rocks of the Blue Ridge were deposited and, and, uh, and heated and metamorphosed. Um, in the Upper Devonian to the Mississippian, about uh, 370 million years ago, sidling hill rocks. Um, Coles and Crossburg were in the Pennsylvanian about 325 million years ago. Um, in the Triassic, we had rift valleys in Maryland, like the rift valleys in Africa. Um, and the Gettysburg Basin through, uh, through Federalsburg, uh, not through Federalsburg, through um, uh, Frederick, and some very uh, rift valleys occurred. And then the earliest coastal plain, um, rocks is really a uh, long term because of really sediments were deposited in the Cretaceous, and finally in the tertiary covered cliffs and, and the whole evolution of the Chesapeake Bay. So I'm going to look more specifically now at the Devonian from about 415 to about um, 360 million years ago. And in the middle of that time frame, about just uh, 390, 385 to 390 million years ago, the Marcellus um, was deposited, along with the uh, a variety of other deposits uh, above and below over that time frame. And in, in that total period, about 10,000 feet of, uh, of material was deposited, including, including the Marcellus. So what did the Earth look like, or what did this part of the world look like at the beginning of the Marcellus? Um, this, is, uh, this is a pretty good estimate of what things were like 400 million years ago. The uh, white line is the equator. So north is to the upper left there. Um, and hopefully you can see sort of outlines of the states. So here's, here's Pennsylvania, here's West Virginia, Maryland. Um, and in this box is, is kind of the area of focus. There was a mountain range. It was a very shallow inland sea with a, a narrow connection to the ocean. And there were these uh, archipelagos offshore. It's kind of like Japan or, uh, or the Philippines off the west coast of the United States. Nice. West coast of uh, Asia, excuse me. So, another little movie. So within that box, we're now looking at a cross section where <clears throat> there's basically the, the uh, land masses under uh, Baltimore and Philadelphia. Here's that shallow inland sea. <coughs> the sands in the Oriscidae were being deposited in the shallow inland sea at that point in time. Um, lots of fossils in there. We had the archipelago over here called Acadia. This is the Acadian orogeny. And what happens is, as you'll see, um, we'll go through this once or twice, but basically the timeline on the, on the upper right will progress upwards and you'll see how the uh, these various land masses moved in response, in response to the uh, convection in the deep mantle. Again, right? So Acadia is beginning to approach the proto-North American continent. It's volcanic. There's a lot of, uh, again, like uh, you know, Japan, uh, Manila, um, Mount Fuji, uh, all those volcanoes are pretty active. And as it does approach, the, uh, the shallow sea in the Oriscidae is, uh, is getting a little bit deeper. By about 390 million years ago, it collides with North America, or the proto-North America. And at that point in time, because of that collision, we're starting, we start to downwarp that inland sea where the Oriscidae is. And we, by about 385 million years ago, we start to deposit the Marcellus in the base of this deep, now deep in the sea. And as time goes on, the sea gets deeper, uh, the Mar War Marcellus is deposited. Finally, uh, the erosion of the, the highlands, the mountains, in what's now the Baltimore, Philadelphia area, start to, start to spew sediments to the west, or you know, dry sediments to the west, and they, they bury the Marcellus under later Devonian formations. And then finally we get um, the Catskill Delta <coughs> bending out over the top, which is basically a subaerial um, uh, landmass, so it's river systems and, and such. And Africa then, things are still colliding here. Africa begins to approach, but it goes away. It comes back much later. 
So I just run through that one more time. It's kind of a cool little movie. It makes it makes it kind of easy to see this. Um, the other thing to note is that the, um, start once more. At the beginning, we've got those volcanoes in Acadia, and you'll notice it, it seems like the dominant wind direction is to the west, we're showing. By the time Acadia collapses into North America, the volcanoes are gone. So the, the analog for this in today's world would be the Black Sea, with you know, Russia, or the, the Caucasus on the, on the east, Russia, Ukraine, uh, Ukraine on the uh, north, Europe on the west here, and, and Turkey on the south. A, you know, a deep, a deep inland sea. It's salty. It has a very restricted connection through uh, the straits you know, where Istanbul is. It's about 7,000 feet deep at the deepest spot, and it's about 1,000 feet deep up to the north. But, but because of the restricted sea, <coughs> there's not much water motion in there, and all the water below about 300 feet down is anoxic. It's devoid of oxygen. Talk about the Chesapeake Bay being anoxic. This is a big, big system. So all the organ all the organic stuff that's living, all the plankton, all the fish, everything is living in that upper 300 feet, 300, 600 feet of the water column. When it dies, it settles down through the water. Since there's no oxygen at the bottom, decomposition still occurs, but it occurs at a very slow rate. So lots of organic material gets preserved. This is what happened in the Marcellus. Lots of organic material got preserved. So it's just a, a sort of a cross section through a, a, a mine near uh, near Kaiser, I think. Uh, it's a they're mining the Oriskany sandstone, and the red arrow is meant to indicate um, what would be going on underground if you were a driller drilling a conventional well. You'd be you'd be targeting the Oriskany sandstone um, because that's where most of the gas is. You go through the Marcella shale, through the Onondaga limestone, and the Needmore shale. And I guess it, this sort of makes sense to me, but you know, all those different words, uh, everything's, you know, we've got Marcellus shale, we've got Needmore shale. The, the second word describes, you know, what it is. Is it a limestone? Is it a, is it a shale? Is it a sandstone? Other forms. The first word is, is generally named by the person uh, who first uh, completely describes this formation um, at a particular area called the type locality. He usually picks a, he or she picks a name from that locality. So somewhere, there might be a risk in the town or county or stream um, where the type locality for the risk is. So that's, that's the origin of those two, two names. I don't really know, in these cases, where the names came from. But you can see we've got <clears throat> not only the Marcellus shale, but there's, there's other shales and, and limestones here, too. So just quickly, these are some outcrops, some quick pictures of the, uh, the Onondaga limestone. Again, at the base of the Marcellus, Marcellus, the dotted line indicates what we mark as the, the, the top of the Onondaga and the beginning of the Marcellus. And at the very base of the Marcellus is the Tioga Betonite, Betonite being ash fall. So that's, that's the ash fall from those Arcadian, Acadian volcanoes that were erupting out to the southeast and whose winds were blowing into, the, into this deep basin. And they deposited this uh, Betonite uh, which was then metamorphosed, so now it's a metamet um, It's really not very thick, um, but it's a, it's a good marker for us. Over that is what's the, what we call the lower Marcellus shale. We'll talk about it a little more length. But a polished, polished cross section of the lower Marcellus would look like this. Um, and I don't know how visible it is, but you can see, hopefully, that there are these very thin laminations and they're pretty continuous darker areas are the ones that are more rich in organic material, and the lighter areas have less of organic material for one reason or another. It could have been diluted with some wind-blown ash or wind-blown uh, sands and silts. It could have been some river deposits. But this is pretty typical. Very little pore space. That's what it looks like. Um, when it's out at the surface, it weathers. <clears throat> Being in an anoxic basin, you've got a lot of, um, there's a lot of iron, deposited there. There's a lot of sulfur that comes along with seawater, 
and in those anoxications you get iron sulfides being deposited, primarily pyrite, just like in coal beds. Um, and when you weather them, you produce sulfuric acid, just like in acid mine drainage. And if you see a Marcellus on the surface, this is pretty much what you see. It's iron staining because that iron is coming out. And <clears throat> you're getting iron sulfates and sulfuric acid. Overlying the lower Marcellus, I should say, well, no, no. overlying the Marcellus is still, overlying the lower Marcellus is still something that's part of the Marcellus formation as you described it, and it's called the Purcell limestone, remember. Something changed in the chemistry of that ocean at that point in time. Don't really know. It got shallower, different inputs and material, and it allowed um, uh, limestone to precipitate out, or lime, calcium carbonate to precipitate out, along with the organic material. So you get significant dilution of the organic material during the deposition of this limestone section, which is about um, 30 to 50 feet thick. The lower Marcellus is about 100 feet thick. The Purcell uh, limestone is about 30 to 50 feet thick. And when the Purcell weathers, um, you get this kind of flaky uh, deposits as lime lime and organic materials are splitting along these bedding planes. Some areas that are still more organic, um, you're getting, you're getting that, those iron sulfates that are, uh, that are oxidizing give you the red banding in there too. Overlying the, um, the Purcell member is the upper Marcellus, where we kind of flip to the other side of an anticline here, so I think it's backwards, but relative to the way we were moving up the section before. The upper Marcellus member is back into a shale, just not as organic rich. And overlying that, again, the dotted line is the top of the top of the Marcellus. Overlying that is something called the Nahantango Formation. And this marked the point in time when Acadia had completely welded onto the North American continent. Those mountains were as high as they, they could get, and they're starting to erode pretty rapidly. So we're getting a lot of a lot of sediment coming off those mountain ranges and being put into the deep sea. And initially, okay, well there's, this is the shot of the upper, uh, uh, a slab cross section of the uh, upper Marcellus. Similar to, to below, to the previous one, but there's fewer of those thin uh, black bands with a high organic material and, uh, and some intervening limestones, uh, or lime, carbonate lime rich areas. So, <clears throat> what happened in the deposition of Mahantango is, uh, is that loose sediment that was accumulating up, um, trying to get the perspective right for you guys. Um, you know, the Acadian Mountains are over here. Um, they're, they're starting to uh, erode and they're being deposited on the edge of a continental shelf, like off, off the continental shelf of the United States, Eastern United States now, and periodically you get a turbidity flow where the material, you know, for one reason or another, a storm event, an earthquake, and, uh, it just builds up, you know, too steep uh, formation, chaotically slides down and, and, and buries the, uh, the deep water uh, Marcellus shale formation under these thin turbidites, as we call them. So, that's the, you know, the bottom, then we, uh, the bottom of the Marcellus, again, we're depositing the deep water. First there's a lower formation, then the, uh, the, the Purcell line rich member, then an upper Marcellus section, finally Mahantango. And if we drill down, on the left here, we've got those formations identified. Also, this always a complication. Uh, this is a little further west, west of Kaiser's Ridge. So now we have the Huntersville Church. Uh, sand, uh, very fine uh, uh, silica quartz, silica that blew in um, probably just as windblown deposits from from the west, actually. So if you go west in Maryland, you, you encounter this uh, church. But if you go to the east of, of Kaiser's Ridge, uh, there's, there's essentially none. But we've got the lower member, the Purcell limestone, and then the upper member of the Marcellus. And underneath that is this Anaton limestone. The way gas companies or oil companies, uh, once they drill the well, they send these uh, logs down and they try and try and identify, they can use some of those records to identify what they think they're in. The red line is, is um, gamma ray, so basically it's radioactivity. And you 
you see that the base of the Marcellus, this thing just spikes up. And that's, that's the mark. When, you, when, when they hit that, they know that they're at the, at the base of the Marcellus. Two reasons for that. One is the Tioga bentonite, which is the ash fall, contains a lot of native uranium. It's coming up from the deep mantle, and that's what, that's what keeps the, the core of the earth hot, is the uh, radioactive materials. So there's a lot of that in the ash fall. And the, the uranium series in the periodic table, if any of you remember your chemistry, I can barely remember. Uh, and, the, and the transuranium elements, they, unlike other elements in the periodic table, they tend to precipitate out in an, ox in an environment, an aqueous environment that has no oxygen, that is anoxic. So they come out of solution and they get incorporated in the shell. The other little, uh, little squiggles are density, density of the material, how hard it's going to get through, um, and a neutron density log. I don't know what the heck that is, but you know, for example, here you can see where the where the churn is. The density drops or get density goes way up. Basically, is the density log. So it's you know, that's really solid stuff. Nothing's getting. Through. So you've got the organic material in this deep, uh, in this deep um, <coughs> Marcella shale, and what happens to it? Well, we're looking at a, a cross section of the uh, of this uh, sea that the Marcellus was accumulating in. There's this uh, dotted line at the top is the picnicline and the thermocline. Above that is, is oxygenated water. Below it, the water is very dense. Um, and there's no mixing going on, so that's why there's a lack of oxygen. We know that there's no oxygen because, among other things, we don't see any, we don't see any fossils collecting. We don't see any fossils that live in this mud. There are some fossils, but they're things that were pelagic that swam around in the ocean and settled at the bottom. In Purcell time, and remember that. Think back to that picture, and I pointed out that the, this little inland sea had a very narrow lead narrow open to the ocean, narrow aperture to the ocean, like the Black Sea. That's what had to help keep this thermocline in place. In Purcell time, something happened. So that, that thermos, thermocline, picnicline dropped way down. Um, we started to precipitate these limestones. It was a chemistry change. Um, and there's a lot more uh, organisms in the water column because we've got a lot of uh, a lot more water to live in. And so we get a lot more uh, fossils in the, in the, um, in the cell limestone. Theory one is that sea level dropped in that point in time, allowing more mixing. The other theory is that sea level rose, which opened up that fairway a little bit and allowed more seawater, more tidal action, more seawater to come in. We really don't know which happened. It just shows us the scenario one. By, by the late Marcellus time, so we're now depositing the upper Marcellus formation, Thermocline, picnicline is somewhere in the middle. Um, we're getting uh, the final upper Marcellus being deposited. Again, there's no uh, organisms that are in the bottom or things that are dripping down from the surface as, as fossils. And again, the chemistry has changed. There's a lot more again, there's a lot more carbonate material in that upper member. So gas companies, they're going to look for, one of the first things we, we look for is, is uh, organic material in, in, the, uh, in the shales. And if you've got more than 1% total of organic material, that's, you're doing okay. You're, you've got a good potential for some kind of hydrocarbon. If you get more than about 3%, you've got, you know, you've got really good stuff, as it were. And you can see that in the lower Marcellus, we're upwards of four, five, six percent. That's why it's the target uh, for these gas companies. The Purcell limestone in the middle, still part of the Marcellus shale, but the Purcell member, uh, very low. And then the upper Marcellus, yeah, we're in a good range, you know, two to three percent, but nowhere near as, as much as the lower Marcellus. And a previously deposited shale in, in Devonian time, the Nemoor down at the bottom, 
it's pretty good potential too, but you know, why go there when you go to the Marcellus? When you got 4% organic material. We need more than just organic material. We need a particular type of organic material and we need to um, heat it and pressurize it. And subsequent, uh, you know, so this, this is pretty, this is 7,000 feet deep already and it's covered over with all these rocks and um, you know, all these sediments from uh, the overlying formations. We had uh, subsequent to this, uh, you know, Africa collided with North America. We had the Appalachian Mountains grow up. So there's a lot of, a lot of deep burial, a lot of pressurization and, and heating. So the organic material can, of any kind can convert into kerogens, um, which is just their long chain hydrocarbons, uh, just a term. Um, Basically, there's four types, just really briefly. Type one would be what we got in the Marcellus. Um, it's primarily algal material that was living in the water column and then settled to the bottom in the anoxic basin and got preserved. Uh, type two um, makes, uh, ends up uh, making waxy kind of uh, uh, byproducts. Um, and that comes primarily from spores and leaves. Um, cellulose and swamps um, yields to woody plant material becomes type three um, carrageens, which ultimately becomes coal with enough heat and pressure. And then type four is just sort of pure carbon. So we've got type one carrageen, and they can, so we, you know, the, come in and measure the uh, organic material, try and figure out what type of carrageen it is, and then try and figure out if it's been heated and pressurized enough to convert it into a hydrocarbon. And Maybe kind of confusing, but uh, let's try and try and work through it. I think it's pretty straightforward. We look at coal. One of the ways we measure, <clears throat> I don't do this, but one of the ways that that um, the amount of uh, thermal maturity uh, is measured, and that would be how we're just like we've heated these rocks, we're meta heating and metamorphosing organic material, is with a byproduct of uh, coal. Well, there's a, a waxy substance called vitronite that's formed. And you can measure the reflectance of light off. And they figured out that you know, at about 0 0.5, just random number, that's, that means you heat it to about 60 degrees and so on. Uh, one is about 100 degrees, two is 140 degrees. And if you've got the right types of material, if you've got coal over here, the type three carriages, you, you know, by the time you get into twos and threes range, we're, we're into um, Pretty high grade bituminous and semi anthracite, and by the time you're a three year anthracite uh, type coal. If you've got type one carrageens, then you're working on this side, and once you hit about 0.5 vitronite, 60 degrees, we start to form oil, and when you're down at about one uh, vitronite reflectance of one, about 100 degrees centigrade, we start to form gases. And as you proceed down, uh, here you get you know, very dry gas. Ultimately, what will happen is you'll cook all the hydrocarbons out. So in that process, we're taking the kerogen, which is these long chain carbons and hydrogens, and we're just breaking them down more and more. So that methane is pretty far down, methane, which is natural gas. One carbon, four hydrogens. You cook it a little bit more, you drive off all the hydrogen, and you've only got carbon. Gas. So you just have Maturity in Western Maryland and Pennsylvania. Using the measures of vitronite reflectance again. Um, so in Garrett County, we're running right around 2.5 to 2.7. So again, we're in the semi anthracite to the anthracite zone for coals. And looking back at that slide, at somewhere in the 2.5 range, we're down way below oil formation, purely in gas. So looked at in cross-section now, so laid the map down, so the same reflectance numbers. This is what's going on across uh, Maryland from the eastern side, Washington, D.C., sort of Baltimore, got all these hard rocks. We're not showing all the numbers, but these are later collisions, the Appalachian uh, mountain chain is much higher over here. And finally, um, at the 
Babylonian is shown in blue. And west of the, uh, of the Allegheny Front, the Dance Bridge, I believe. Excuse me, there's a fan moving back here, and we cannot hear you. OK. Sorry. Thank you. can't hear you from up here. Can you take the mic off? Sure. Can you okay. take the mic off the stand and carry it with you? Sorry, guys. Part of Maryland, we've got uh, high-grade uh, metamorphic rocks, no sedimentary materials. The, uh, the Devonian age rocks are shown in blue um, off to the west, uh, under Garrett and, and, and Allegheny County. Again, if you miss the thing about the vitronite reflectance, um, I'll just go back a second because I think this is this is key here. In order to get gas out of out of the uh, the carrigens and the organic material, we have to have pretty high temperatures, um, 120, 140 degrees centigrade for a pretty long period of time. So our vitronite reflectance has to be in the range of, you know, one and three quarters and above. Just a measurement that, that can be made. That would be equivalent to anthracite type coals. So in Western Maryland, um, our vitronite reflectance is in the 2.5 to 3 range, where we find it, putting us in those uh, semi-anthracite to anthracite coals. And off on the far right, um, into this uh, sort of dominantly wet gas to dry gas. So we're, we're dry gas meaning that it's pretty much all methane. Wet, wet gas would be, we've got some propane and butane and, and other components in it too. Marcellus seems to be, from all I've heard, a very dry gas resource. Gas companies like that because they don't have to do a lot of splitting off of these other components. They can feed it straight into the pipelines. So to the, um, to the east of the Allegheny Front, which is, uh, I believe, Dan's Mountain, got Devonian age rocks, including uh, the Marcellus, but they're pretty highly folded and compressed. <coughs> and the vitronite reflectance is way up around three. To the west of Dan's Mountain, still some folding. And, and the black lines being uh, some folding, but uh, you know, generally speaking, it's a much more uh, much less compressed area, and the vitronite reflectance uh, numbers are a little bit lower. So what do we know about its distribution in Maryland? The map on the bottom, um, the yellow are rocks that are younger than the Marcellus, the gray are rocks older than the Marcellus, and the Marcellus shale outcrops are shown in, in the dense black. actually have outcroppings of the Marcellus at the surface. In the top section, um, you can see the west of that um, Allegheny front, uh, the, full, the, the bending and, and the flexures are much less, and, and the Marcellus is, uh, is more even at depth. The map that we put together for the um, on a map illustrating the thickness in Maryland, and is is this. Uh, so basically, um, far to the east, the Marcellus is the thickest, 250 feet. Uh, to the west, it's the thinnest, somewhere on the order of uh, 150 feet in total thickness. Um, and our data points are shown by the little red 
circles and dots. Most of them are, are the open donuts. I'm not sure if they're visible. Uh, the great majority of those uh, are information we have from wells, but not from gas producing, or not from Marcellus gas producing wells. These are from wells that were drilled through the Marcellus um, to get to the Euriscity so we know the thickness of the Marcellus in those areas. When were those wells dug? Most of the wells in Maryland um, were, the first well in Maryland was drilled in 1888. When were these indicated on your map? When were they drilled? I'm not sure about all. I can tell you all the ones in the accident dome were built, drilled in the 1940s. What about the ones in the southern part of the county? There's an active gas mm -hmm. field down there. Um, offhand, I don't know, sir. I would, I would. There's an active shallow field in the southern part of the county that they pretty much demand. You can see it in Pleasant Valley. There's a distribution line down there. Yeah. Is that from a, a shallower? Formation. I would and I would guess if they went to the Oriskany, these are these are through the Marcellus to go to the Oriskany. So, because that is the dominant gas source, was the dominant conventional gas source in Maryland. But in the 40s, they were using a cable tool type rig to drill, and you can't get 3,000, 6,000 feet, just 3,000, 4,000 feet on a cable tool a long way down. Well, they're all in the Oriskany. Those are. All the ones in the accident field are in the Oriskany. Now, the Oriskany could be shallower there. I don't know, off, off the top of my head. Um, but these are, these are the, the, the data points that we have for, for Maryland for the thickness of the Marcellus. Now, one thing to remember again, this is only the thickness. It doesn't refer to the organic content. It doesn't refer to how much it's been cooked as reflected, as indicated by the vitronite, vitronite reflectors. So, even though the Marcellus might be thickest to the east in, uh, in Allegheny County, it doesn't necessarily mean that the most gas is going to be there because it's been cooked a lot harder, the vitronite reflectance was a lot higher, and it's been more significantly, potentially more significantly diluted by uh, sedimentary materials that came from the Acadian Mountains. So probably the organic content is lower to the east, even though it's thicker higher to the west, where the basin was deeper, um, a little further away from the land masses, and where the uh, rocks hadn't been cooked as high over time. From those same uh, data points, basically the depth of the Marcellus um, is shown, shown on this slide, and basically we're over, in the darkest reds, we're over 8,000 feet down, um, and so on. Uh, 6,000 to 8,000 are the browns. Um, uh, the lighter browns are four to 6,000, and, and the yellows are between zero and 4,000 feet. So on the edges of the yellow, although it's not shown here, would be where the Marcellus is, is uh, on the free edge of the yellow before the, before the uh, gray, would be where the Marcellus is outcropping at the surface. So in the accident dome area, um, it looks like we'd be in the, in the 4,000 to 6,000 foot range for the Marcellus risk and would be under that. I think it, this is a, an instructive slide for, um, this is through the 12th of November of this year, um, all the shale drilling permits in Pennsylvania. Um, you can see where they're concentrated, uh, up in the northeast, north central, um, and down in the far southwest. Is, uh, I think it's sort of potentially instructive that Although who knows what's driving uh, this distribution of, of wells, certainly no wells here would look like a hot spot except it's Pittsburgh. So, you know, it's a pre-urbanized area and they're not really permitting anything there. But I think it's instructive for, uh, for Garrett County that, that there's a relative paucity of, of wells um, immediately to the north of Pennsylvania. You know, is that? Again, there could be multiple factors leading to this, but it's just uh, interesting from that perspective. Um, finally, a couple things, uh, that the other things that the oil company or gas companies will look for, um, if they can figure it out, this is a, an outcrop of Marcellus in, uh, in New York, and you can see these um, joint patterns, fractures basically, that are linear. Well, if you're gonna drill this horizontal 
bore. What you want to do is figure out what the joint pattern is where you're drilling. You want to drill perpendicular to that because those are the areas that are going to transmit the most gas without any stimulation, without any fracking. And again, uh, you know, that outcrop that I showed way back when, I you can see those uh, planes on the surface that reflected the, uh, the joint patterns. Um, the little bit we know about the natural uh, fractures uh, in the Marcellus shale are shown by these uh, Called rose diagrams, so that would be the orientation of these joints. So, if the, you know, if the gas company was going to come in um, and, and drill a horizontal well, at least initially, it probably would try and work um, perpendicular to those joint patterns. And you can see that they change across the state because of this, uh, because of this uh, different compressions that have happened. And those are all out of the state of Maryland. Where do they? How do they fit into the state? Yeah, we don't. Unfortunately, the uh, th those are the nearest proximate samples that we are aware of. Oh, they haven't done anything in this. They right. haven't done anything in Maryland. They've done everything in Pennsylvania, right. West Virginia. But until the permits get issued right. from Maryland, right. you're not going to know what's where and when, how these fracture lines are running mm -hmm. until you get permitted. Now, Pennsylvania's got. Uh, if you look back at the other slide, how many of those have been done in the last three years, okay, they're producing money. That's putting money into the general fund. That's putting their men and women working. And, and Maryland's still sitting on their ass. Well, and I, and I can tell you that, um, you know, when the gas company comes and drills uh, and, and determines what the fracture pattern is, um, we're, not gonna we know. Know. we're not going to know. We're not going to know. They're not going to tell us. So just a little, a final sort of movie on, on, uh, on drilling here. So basically, again, we start with a, a vertical, um, vertical bore, which is drilled from, driven from the surface. Um, it's then cased below the lowest freshwater aquifer. So one of the issues is determining how deep is the freshwater. That you're drilling, well, that's one of the issues. And, and you're meant to cement it. Um, and you go down um, again with conventional rotary drilling to the kickoff point. 